If I would ask you this evening, what are your thoughts on the wilderness place, this destination of a desert? Many would say, I believe, that the wilderness speaks of a dryness, no rain, or a place that is very difficult to cultivate and plant food, a place that might be lonely, isolated. Many things that live in the wilderness, they don't survive. Biblically speaking, as we look at the word, the wilderness is described as a place on earth, on earth that is cracked, it has valleys, it forms, especially if you go to Israel and you see the, the wilderness of Judea, you see these valleys in these cracks that wait for rain to come to fill them, but it never does. So spiritually, as we look at it, and many, many believe that when we speak of wilderness as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, it speaks of a dry soul. Many of us tonight, we wouldn't be the first ones to sign up if there was a, a mission trip to the wilderness. I don't think we would be signing up so quickly for that. But what if I was to tell you this evening as we look to God's word, this is exactly where God desires us to bring us into the wilderness spiritually. See, there are times by our own decisions that we put ourselves in a dry and thirsty land. And God is sovereign and he allows us to do this. He allows us to make choices that may cause our spirit to move into a dry and thirsty land. And he allows it because we possibly need to learn some deep lessons in our lives. And I say possibly because it's still our choice if we want to open up our hearts and minds to receive what God has for us in those decisions that we've made that brought us to a spiritual wilderness. But spiritual wilderness that God calls you to is a season that we should embrace. We should desire to go into a wilderness place alone with God. See, the scriptures don't hold back regarding this thought. See, God revealed himself to Moses and gave him his call in the wilderness in Exodus 3. Our worship, how to serve God, was revealed in the wilderness. When God told Moses with this message that he, or excuse me, when Moses told Pharaoh with this message that God gave him in Exodus 7, verse 16, it was in the wilderness. The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to, to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. That word uh, serve there can also speak of worshiping, that we may worship me in the wilderness. God was saying not, not just to learn in the wilderness to, to serve, but also to worship. See, in the wilderness, many things take place in the Old Testament. God brings back families, reunions. Jethro brings Moses, his, his wife, and two sons in Exodus 18. But also in the wilderness, we learn that God teaches us how to release loved ones to him in the wilderness. The family members, the loved ones that choose to disobey God. In Numbers 14, 29, it says, your bodies will fall in this wilderness we all know that they fell because of disobedience to God. And every time I look at that scripture, we see two men, Joshua and Caleb, and I always wonder how they felt. I always wonder that the 40 years of the wandering in the wilderness as generation passed because of their disobedience, how Joshua and Caleb felt. Learning of the pain to release their family, family members to trust, to trust God because they couldn't do nothing about it. They couldn't change their hearts. And I often wonder, as some of us do this evening, that releasing our family members and our loved ones that choose to disobey God, that we have to release them into God's hands. And year after year, decade after de decade, they fall, they die. Joshua and Caleb experienced that, that pain and suffering. But what they didn't do was release their faith in God. They held on to the promises of God. In the Old Testament, we also see God revealing himself in so many ways to the children. The manna, the rock, the water from the rock, the anointing of the new leader, Joshua. This all happened in the wilderness. In the New Testament, we see Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness right after his public baptism. 
He's, left, he's led into the wilderness by the Spirit. The Bible says in Matthew 4, chapter, uh, verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It was the wilderness, the isolation, that the Holy Spirit allowed Jesus to be tempted. Jesus revealed to us as an example on how we should resist temptations by the evil one, by applying his word. And it's only when we're isolated, it's only when we're alone with God that the word of God can penetrate our souls and our hearts and our minds that we're able to fight against temptation. In Psalms 119, verse 9, it says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With your whole heart I sought you, I have sought you. Oh, let not my wander from your your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, we see as the Christian walk, it is not something that we should run from. It's something that we should embrace if God is calling you to the wilderness, to grow deeper with him. And as we pick up in Psalm 63, this is exactly where King David is, revealing the greatest hunger of his soul as he flees the kingdom from his son, Aslam. So in verse one, it says this, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. The soul wants God as a thirsty land desires the freshing showers of rain, as an opening flower desires the sunbeam of light. Our soul desires God. In the very same way, every human heart thirsts for God, whether you know it or not, that's the thing that's lacking in the unbeliever's heart, is God. See, I believe for all of us, at least some of us this evening, we all have a desire to meet with God this evening. We all walk through those doors to come to church. And we should have an expectation that I was gonna meet God as we open up his word, that I, we should have an expectation that God's gonna meet us in this moment. But desire doesn't get us anywhere if that's all we have. It's the obedience of applying God's word into action that moves the desire of our hearts into transformation. That's how we change, by applying his word. So do we bring the burning coals to the altar this evening? No matter how bright your walk is with the Lord or how lack of there, do we come with that expectation That God is our God. See, David knew this. He came with an expectation, even in the wilderness, to meet with the living God. Why? Because he knew God was his. That's why we see in verse one, oh God, you are my God. The hunger of David's soul was his intimate relationship with God, which led him to the greatest faith of his soul, putting his trust in his God. This was the greatest joy of our Savior's heart. This is revealed in the New Testament. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is what kept Jesus on the cross. The joy, the joy that salvation would come to our door the joy that we would have an opportunity to come to faith in him, the joy that he could dwell with us, the joy of us going into the wilderness to to be with him one-on-one. The joy of our Lord's heart is when his children come in a deeper understanding that he is their God. It's not holding the coat towels of our husbands or our wives or our children or our grandchildren, our friends or even our pastor's faith. It's ours. He is ours. It's us understanding individually as David did. Oh God, you are my God. And possession of knowing that you're a child of God always breeds desire to move closer to him. Look at what we see. It says, early will I seek you. That word early, it speaks of respect of life. As soon as I wake up, I will seek the Lord. 
But what's also interesting in this word, it can also speak of an eagerness to do it with passionate, to be zealous for it as you wake up early in the morning that you will can't, you, you will, can't wait to get downstairs to open up your word, to kiss the face of Jesus as you open up his word. If we truly desire to have the capacity to exercise godliness throughout the day, then we should speak to the one who, who has given us our spirit, who has given us the breath before the day even starts. I heard, once heard this. It says, when the bed is soft, we are most tempted to rise at lazy hours. But when comfort is gone, the couch is hard. If we rise the early to seek the Lord, we have that much for which to thank the wilderness. Isolation, the difficult things of life, is what blesses us to seek God's face even more. It's when everything is washed away and everything set aside that we understand that all that matters is God. Jesus was this beautiful example to us. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. The psalmist says in Psalm 5, verse 3, My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and will look up. Before the world seizes our hearts and fills our minds with vanity and worry, because that's what takes place, every single one of us know this, seek his face early. Before we allow the troubles of the world to flood our minds and discourage our hearts, Seek the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength and mind. See, there's a story in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, as we all know, that when Jesus was approached by a scribe, after this scribe had heard him reasoning, he asked them this question, what is the first commandment of all? And we see Jesus' answer in Mark 12, verse 29. It says, the first of all the commandments is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. There's no other commandment. There's no other desire in our hearts in the morning other than to seek his face early. We don't come to his word under the influence. And I'm not speaking of alcohol beverages, even though we should know that shouldn't take place as we approach his holy word. I'm talking about things on our minds that cause us to drift. We don't approach God's word in such a way where we just flip through the pages to find out what God's gonna speak to us. We approach his word wanting a desire to know who he is. We approach his word in the wilderness and we seek him intelligently, earnestly, constantly, hopefully, and always with the expectation that he is going to meet us there. See, I've come to learn, and I'm still learning in many, many ways, that the holy desire of an inner being, my inner being, is the most powerful influence to stir my heart to action in ministry, is when I spend time with the Lord, and when I have that desire. We seek him early because Jesus is the life of our soul. And this is what David is explaining here. This is what David is experiencing here in Psalm 63. He goes on and says, My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. See, thirst upon a physical body, we know this, that we can't go many days without drinking water or drinking some type of fluids. It's something we can't ignore. Our body tells us this. But in every man's heart, in every person alive, will yield to this desire to be refreshed physically, even to the point of death, because it will take you down. But how much more does our soul thirst for his presence? This is what David is speaking of. My soul thirsts for God. David's body had pangs of, of weariness, of, of pain, because of his, his deep-seated pain, the desire to be touched by God again an outpouring of God's spirit upon his life. Every anointed person, every man or woman that's been anointed by God's touch knows when that, 
that anointing has been lifted. Whether it be in disobedience, whether it be in not being in their devotion time, whether it be in seeking the things of the world to bring satisfaction to their hearts, every anointed man knows that. That they need to get back to the things of God. But God has fulfilled this promise to you and me this evening that whoever should ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God will give. Jesus said in John 7, 37, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit will flood you, will fill you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. In totality, this gushing forth of a fulfillment of your soul that the Holy Spirit is the only one that could fulfill. But so many refuse to come. So many still seek the desert, the things of the world to try to fulfill their soul and it will never produce, it can never produce that longing of your heart. It cannot fulfill the thirst of God in every human heart. It's like a sailor who is shipwrecked, drinks salt water because he's so wildly thirsty and it makes him mad. So some today that continue to go after the things of the world to fulfill their soul. See, even believers, even us, when we're called into this dry and thirsty land, this wilderness, can lose our perspective and look once again at the things of the world to find fulfillment. That happens constantly in our lives. We have to be able to set our minds back on the things of God daily. Never forget at times, it is the absence of the outward comforts of the world that brings us back to the proper perspective that all we need is God. For David, there was no wilderness in his heart, even though he was surrounded by wilderness here. In Isaiah 26, three, it says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. With knowing who we are in God, knowing that God is ours, we are his children, we seek him, we thirst for him, we long for him in all the areas of our lives. We look to see his power and glory. Look at verse two. So I've looked for, the, for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. See, the Old Testament in the Old Testament, people came to the temple of God to sacrifice, to worship God. And at, that, at this moment in the wilderness, David is, is being reminded, he's, he's reminiscing of the time that he was longing to worship in the sanctuary of God. But we all know that our relationship with God is not confined to courts, altars, or tabernacles, or even a temple, or even this church. Because Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sins has torn down the veil and we now can enter the holies of holies with God. Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is why we have the ability and the understanding that we can come to God. We can come through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. I think we need to understand that, all of us, even including myself, when we're going through difficult times of life, to understand that we can enter God's throne. We can enter his throne. We can obtain mercy and grace in our times of need. We don't have to do it alone. David yearned to see God's power and glory in the sanctuary once again. Where did God reveal his power to you? Where have you experienced a deep longing and desire of your soul to behold his face? You know, some of us here this evening have, have a thought that just comes to mind when I say that. God met me here at this time in my life, and he revealed his power, his glory. I remember a time for me about seven and a half years ago. God was doing a great thing in my life, and he decided to intervene, to change things up. And he wanted to grow my family. He put the brakes on everything that I thought that my life was gonna become. 
And he said, no, we, we're going to grow your family right now. It was a, it's, it's, been, it's a blessing. It was a blessing. It is a blessing. But it wasn't easy. And I remember that as I longed to do the things for the Lord, that God continued to remind me, I'm going to grow your family. And we did. And I struggled. I was in Bible college, and I was, you know, being fed the word, doing my devotions, but there was something that was lacking in my heart. I was trapped. I was, it, was, it was something that I couldn't remove from myself. See, I was pouring into my boys, and, and that's what I was doing, and, and God was moving in that. And, and when he added to our family, it was, I felt like I had no capacity to love any further. There was a fear that overcame me. Even as I was in Bible college, even as at times I was doing ministry, it wasn't something sinful that I was doing, but I was, it, was a, it was a capacity that I, I felt like I couldn't give more. And when I was driving home one Tuesday night, three-hour class, and I'm struggling with this, and me and my wife are dealing with this, and she's trying to walk me through this, but she kept saying, what's, what's the matter? And I just kept saying, I just feel like I can't love anymore. I'm tapped. And a good friend of mine that evening, I pulled over to the side of the road, and I'm, I'm pouring out my heart that I just can't do this. I can't move forward in this. I don't want to destroy lives. And instead of giving me Bible verses, he, let me, he, just let, he let me pour out my heart to him. He became that backboard. And I never forgot, and I applied the advice that he, he gave me that evening, and I still apply it to my life today. He said this. He said, you know, the reason why you can't receive any more love is because the source of love, God himself, you're blocking him from your heart. You need to allow him to pour out his love. You need to accept God's love for you so that you can pour out more, that overflow. Something so simple that I've heard through so many different teachings and looking through the word myself, but it had a great impact on my life. And day by day, moving forward, week by week, month by month, year by year, God met me. He showed me his power. He showed me his glory that he was going to get us through, and he's still getting us through in this. Yeah, Jared's right. I do have eight children, and it's not easy. We don't, we don't get any sleep, but that's okay. <laughs> but if that's what it took for God to show me his glory and his power, then I wouldn't exchange it for anything in this world. So whatever that you're going through, whatever your story is, where did God meet you? Maybe in a broken relationship, maybe in a, a failed marriage, maybe in a lost child, maybe in a diagnosis of you don't got many more days on this earth. Where did God meet you? Don't change it for the world because that's where he's gonna reveal his power and his glory to you, just like he did for David in this wilderness place. Because we have experienced God in this way, no place, no banishment of the wilderness. It doesn't matter. What matters is knowing him. John 17, three says, this is eternal life that we may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Look at verse three. It brings out worship when we do this. When we have an experience of God's power and glory. In verse three, it says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you. While I live, I will lift up my hands to your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with the, the marrow and the fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. In verse six, he goes on and says, when I remember you on my bed, I will meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. In verse three, he, he speaks of this loving kindness is better than life. See, in truth, us believers, we are always in a dry and weary land. For this is not our world. This is not our home. We are just pilgrims and sojourners. So there should be always a conflict of us here. We shouldn't feel at home in this world. In Philippians 3, verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Chronicles 29, 15, it says that, for we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as we were all our fathers. Our days on this earth are a shadow and without hope. Having a heavenly perspective, 
that we're going home makes life a lot easier. It gives the peace of God in our hearts when we know that we're only here to be an instrument for his glory, to further his kingdom. We just want to be the sharpest tool in his toolbox to be used. What is God telling you this evening? What, what gifts or callings that he's placed on your life this evening that he wants to use you to further his kingdom? Because that's our purpose here on earth is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and in deed. This is why our life on earth is not greater than the love he has for us. This is what David is saying. Because your loving kindness is better than life. Pastor David says this all the time. And it's absolutely true. And the quicker we understand that, the quicker we settle it in our heart, the further God can take us is that we should not be afraid of dying as Christians. We have nothing to lose but behold the face of Jesus when we do. See, in Revelation 22, verse four, it says this, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. They shall be no night there. They need no lamp or no light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. He's speaking of those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. This is how it all ends. We know the end, that we behold his face. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you're in despair. Maybe you feel not loved. Maybe you feel abandoned. Maybe you feel as an orphan. But I can tell you, and I want to encourage you, that if you're a child of God, cheer up. God has claimed you to be one of his. You don't have to feel that way. This is why when we, we, we study his word, we elevate his word above our emotions, our feelings. We elevate his word above all of that. This is what gives us our peace. Why? Because we don't place those things on our heart. We don't have a feeling to move in a direction. We have a a way that God has instructed us through his word to move in a direction. In him, we truly live and move and have our being, which moves us to the heart of gratitude and praise. Look at verse three. It says, uh, the latter part, it says, my lips shall praise you. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied. From verses three to six, he goes on and says, six members of praise, his lips, his hands, his will, his mouth, his memory, and his intellect. Our praise unto the Lord. When we praise Jesus, it should be like the sap that pours out of a tree. It just can't help it. It has to come out. We shouldn't hold back. We should allow it to spew out of our lives. That's when we know we're at the utmost gratitude of what God has done for us, is when we allow our lips, our tongue, our mind, our will, our hands, our feet, our memory to praise him in all that we do. Our lips should praise him. A child of God should be the people that praise with their lips and bless them with their life. We can't hold back. Never forget, it's not the circumstances that dictate the worship. It's the worship that will dictate your circumstances. That's how it operates. When you have a heart of worship, everything around you doesn't matter. When your eyes and your hearts focus on God and what he's done in your life, everything else melts away. In verse four, he goes on, he says, he speaks of lifting up your hands to worship. It's the, it's the picture of a beautiful child being lifted up, wanting to be lifted by his papa. And I understand that even more as, you know, last year I had my first grandson. We start to understand these things when we have little children or grandchildren, when they lift up their hands. That's how we should be with God as his children, lifting up our hands, asking papa to pick us up. In verse five, he speaks of the the marrow and the fatness. This was in the Hebrews. To the Hebrews, the fat was the richest foods of the animal. This is what they gave to God. It all went to God. And as we go on and we look at verse six, it says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. It's interesting because he speaks of when he goes to bed. In the quietness, the alone time, David was meditating on the Lord. The question for us tonight is, what do we ponder when we lay our head, our head on our pillow at night? What keeps us awake? Is it the worries of the world? 
Is it the struggles from the finances? Is it because people said some awful things about you at church or elsewhere? What keeps us up at night? Because if the day's cares tempt us to forget about God, shouldn't the night's quietness lead us to remember him? That's what David was meditating on. David learned to meditate on the deliverances of God in his life. He seeked God early, and he remembered him before he went to bed. He was the beginning and end of his day, but he was the beginning and end of all his life. In Romans eleven thirty six, 36, it says, For him and through him and him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. When we lift up our spirits to the Lord every night before we go to sleep, it brings a greater awareness that we're not promised tomorrow. You know, just in the past week and a half, couple, excuse me, three weeks, but a few days ago, we buried our little cousin, 25 years old. And things like this, I always say, that mountaintops experience, we don't, we don't grow in mountaintops experiences. You know, fellowship and parties and things like that, those are great in itself. Those are blessings, but we really don't grow from those lesson, lessons, but we grow in the valley. We grow when, that, that when death hits us face to face. When, when death is a reality, we understand that it's not the end of it, but many around us don't understand that, that to them, death is final, but to the Christian, it's not. And when we lay our head down on our pillow every night and we seek the Lord, it gives us this great awareness that we may not wake up. God is the one who allows our chest to rise and the living breath to give us rest. In Psalms 90 verse 12, it says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I tell the young adults this all the time, if not every other Monday, that when they leave this campus, we may not see them again. And that's absolutely true. We can turn on the news this evening and we can see young people after young people passing away. In verse seven, he goes on and says, because you have been my help, therefore the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Meditating on God's word and our past experience elevates our thoughts of God, but it also refreshes our soul when we remember what God has done in our lives. We rejoice. We lay on his wings of what he has done and what he will do. You know, when we hear Pastor David talk about the Jesus movement, I have to be very honest with you. It brings a joy to my heart, but at the same time, it brings a yearning to me. We hear him talk about all the different things that happen in the Jesus movement, and I love it, but I yearn for God to pour out his spirit on this generation. I yearn for that to happen again. As much as we look back, we want to reach, for the for, reach forward that God can do it again, and this is what happens when we meditate on what he's done in our life, when we grab his promises and we elevate them and we, we, we trust what God says through his word, we move forward on what he what he has said, and we do it. Even in the uh, wilderness of Judea, King David remembers that God upholds him. Literally speaks of that, that upholds, it speaks of cleaving to him, clinging to the old rugged cross. That's what David was doing. That's the advice that the, the scriptures are giving us this, this evening, to draw close to God and cling to him. In verse, nine, in verse 9 and 10, it speaks of the unbelievers. As us as believers enjoy the richness, richness of God's presence, our enemies will be food for the jackals. Look at, but those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for the jackals. They shall fall by the sword. Yes, this is speaking, this word is speaking of a physical death by violence that the unbelievers are gonna experience in many ways a physical death, absolutely, but by violence. But what's so interesting that this word sword can also speak of the word of God. And the Bible is true and confers, confirms the fact that judgment will come to those who rebel against God. That's an absolute fact. Hebrews 9, verse 27, it says, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment as we've been going on Monday nights through the book of Revelation, 
we see as the Lamb of God, Jesus, opens up the scrolls and the judgments of God proceed, everyone who refused to turn their hearts towards God will have the wrath of God poured out upon them. At times, we can get complacent and forget that these people are not just the enemies of God, and yes, they are in many ways, but these people that we're reading of the judgments that will be poured out on them, these are our friends. These are our neighbors. These are our coworkers and our friends and family members, the ones we love that have rebelled against, rebelled against God's word and have not given their life to Christ. We need to understand that, church. The Bible says in Revelation 9 that it gets so bad with the judgments of God that in verse 6 it says, in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. I, I have very painful experiences in my family of not just one, not just two, but several that have committed suicide. And when I read a verse like this, that the severity of the suffering that will take place upon people that we know if Jesus doesn't come back soon to rapture his church, that people that we know that turn their back on Christ will go through these things, that it will be so bad, the suffering, the plagues upon their lives for rejecting Christ and the way they live, that, that they will seek death and death will flee them. They won't be able to commit suicide. They won't be able to run from it. In Revelation 9.20, it says this, that the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works, of their hands. It goes on to say that they did not repent of their murderers or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their, their thefts. That word sorceries speaks of pharmaceuticals. It speaks of drugs. They did not refuse to put down their drugs. That's what that speaks of. They did not refuse to stop murdering in their heart. They did not repent towards God. Even all the way up until the sixth trumpet of God in the judgments that he allows repentance to come forth if they choose and they choose not to. See, as we look at Psalm 63, I believe that David's heart is broken as we, we come to a close here. Because if it's true, and I believe it is, because in verse 11 we see, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. David is speaking of himself as a king. And he's running from his son Absalom who took the kingdom. And David, knowing God's word, and God's word is faithful and true, and that unrepentant man does not inherit the kingdom of God. This would absolutely be true for his own son. I believe that David was weeping. Even though he was saying what he was saying here, and we, it under, we understand that they try to seek and destroy his life and that, that the sword will fall upon them, he also understood as a father that he had a prodigal son. Maybe some of us have sons or daughters that are not turning towards the Lord. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we weep for the lost? Do we truly break for the lost that's out there, out of these, the, the ones that are outside these walls? Do we go out and pray for them? Do we weep for them? Because we, the church, need to be a people that not hate the sinner, but hate the sin that has overtaken them. That doesn't mean we accept the sin, of course not, but we don't take vengeance. We pray, we love, we give the message of grace. Because in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Do not despise the richness of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. In the wilderness, David rejoiced in these promises, but he yearned. I'll leave you with this. Who or what do you seek this evening? What do you thirst? What is the center of our longing this evening? See, I believe there are many churches. We, the body of Christ, in many ways, we know that not to be true here. But when we get outside these walls, there, there are many churches that preach an obscure message of the gospel. At times, 
they're guilty of preaching a gospel of destination, heaven. Would you like to go to heaven, give your life to Christ? Would you, it's, it's heaven is the, the centerpiece. But heaven is a byproduct when we surrender our life to the one whom dwells in heaven, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we seek. That's where our heart should be placed. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it said, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Let us seek, let us thirst, let us long for our souls for Jesus and nothing else. This is what fulfills the heart of every believer.